All right, hey, we want to welcome everyone who's here, everybody online, and all of our members who are also in the chapel today. As many of you know, um, we are out of the sanctuary for the rest of the month of August, and uh, I was able to poke my head in there. Um, this week, it is exciting to see what's happening. So let's do this. Let's, let's start with this. Okay, um, y'all help me out. This is, this is a charcoal drawing that, that I did. This is actually in my office. Um, I did it during, some of y'all may have been here some years ago, it was Christmas Eve, and I did it during the kids' time. So we were uh, drawing, and I uh, have four or five of these, I think, but gave some of them away to kids. But y'all tell me, kids can help me too, who is this? Anybody? Who is this? G, always a good answer here at Park Cities. Um, Jesus, always the answer. Um, actually, no. That's not Jesus. Oh, good guess. John the Baptist, but no, not John the Baptist. This is, trick question, that's not Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, right. So um, it's an can I say it? It's an image of Jesus. It's a representation of Jesus, right? And it happens to be one, you know, person's, I guess, creative twist on Jesus. Now, there are things that informed my, uh, my drawing here. Um, I, I think he has kind eyes. Now, he's really focused here. He's pretty, he's pretty zoned in. Um, I don't know exactly when this was, where this was. I don't know that I had an idea there. But he's, he's, he's kind, he's focused, he's gentle, he's all those things. I tried to bring that out in this quick um, you know, charcoal drawing of him. But my point there, of course, is uh, that's not Jesus. The representation of Jesus, it's an image of Jesus. We're going to dive into uh, this whole series that is going to be amazing uh, this month called In His Image, as you know and have seen. Um, and what I want you to do is turn to Genesis 1. That's a great place to start. Turn to Genesis 1. We're all going to go there and we're going to dive into this, um, this passage. What we're going to do each week, there's going to be a sermon uh, to set up our time with someone who's going to join us. We have guests who are going to be with us each week. Um, I'm going to call them experts in the field. I don't know if they'd call themselves that, but I think so. Um, today we have Dr. Katie Frugge. Um, and she, I'll, I'll introduce her here in a moment. Excited to have her here next week. We're, uh, and we're really laying the foundation this week is what we're doing. Katie's going to, there's nobody better than Katie to do this. Um, Katie has done her doctoral work, PhD, in really focused on the image of God. And that's what this whole series is about. What does it mean to be created in the image of God with incredible impl implications, right? We say it all the time here. Theology matters. And uh, wow, we are confused about what it means to be. Uh, human nowadays. And there are a lot of issues that come to play, and we're going to talk about all of those. Next week, uh, we have Dr. Tyler Cooper, who's going to be with us, a member of our church that many of you know at the Cooper Aerobic Center. He's going to talk with us about holistic health. Uh, nobody better to talk about physical health, how it plays into our mental health, spiritual, emotional health. He's going to be here with us next week. Um, we're going to have Dr. Katie. Uh, McCoy, who is also a member of our church, going to be talking to us, works with Katie Frugge at uh, Texas Baptist. And uh, the two of them, good friends and doing a lot of great work. Katie has written a book, book called To Be a Woman. We've had her before and talked with her. Um, but uh, she does much around uh, biblical sexuality and the Christian vision of, of human sexuality. So that's in a few weeks. Uh, we'll talk about LGBT a bit and, and trans in particular. She's, you know, that's hot in the news right now. And she uh, has much to say about that. And all of these things from a biblical perspective, right? There is truth that comes to bear on all of these issues culturally and in our personal lives. And that's where all this will land. Um, then after that, we have... Um, Michael Moulton is going to be with us and we're going to talk about addiction and how uh, the image bearer can often, we all, and I say it this way, we're all addicts. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that for the wages of sin is death. Or we, or we all, no, no, all have fallen and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we know that we are bent and impacted by the fall, and that leads to all kinds of craziness. So Michael is going to be with us. He has a ministry helping people come out of addiction. It's going to be an incredible time. We're going to close it out with another member of our church, Dr. Kim, I'm going to call her Dr. Kim Cook, um, who has finished her PhD work 
uh, and not yet has, has uh, kind of completed or finished the final things around that. But she, um, many of you know, uh, the wife of Travis Cook, our own Travis, but she teaches a class here, incredible um, mind around and work that's been done around gifting and how each of us are gifted uniquely to serve the Lord. Okay, so that's where all this is heading. Don't miss a week is really the whole point of that. So let's dive in. A great place to start is um, Genesis chapter one, and we're going to look at verses 26 through 28. Now, a hermeneutical principle we often follow, a translation or interpretation uh, principle we always follow. The Bible, the Bible will never say what it never said. And so what we have to do is look at it through the lens of the original hearers, okay? The original readers. And that's what I want to do today. Like if you were just picking up Genesis and reading it from Genesis 1 and you just dove in, what would you know? We know a lot more, right? Uh, Post Genesis 1. We know a lot more about what happened and we know the full story, if you will, uh, still in the story, the great redemptive story and arc of all of redemption. But what would we know? That's what I want to do today is just sit in this passage that is a mystery. It's why we're still talking about it today. Um, That, you know, there's a lot around it and and Katie uh, is going to help us unpack a lot of this. But um, what is what is Genesis telling us here? And I, I think it's telling us uh, that, that we are created part. There's a lot of ways to go here. Created in the image of God means that we are okay. First seems self-evident. We are created. Okay. Huge implications. So that seems, of course we are, but not so fast. Right? So we are created people. All right. Humans. We are also creators. Some would say we are co-creators. We don't create at ex nihilo is what the theologians call out of nothing like God does. We, we take what we have and we create, but we join him in that. It's part of, the, part of the, the cultural mandate and challenge that he gives that we'll see even here to some degree. And then finally, we're going we're gonna to talk about how we are communal, a word we don't often use. Um, and that is more than just community. We talk about a lot, common unity that we have in Christ. We're created with and for each other. So we find image bearers uh, in other people. And we're going to talk a lot about that and the implications of that. So let's, let's go there, all right? Verse, um, verse 26, here it is. Then God, okay, and by the way, y'all know, chapter one, verse one starts, uh, and God created, right? In the beginning, God. God is assumed in the Bible. We've talked about this in a former series, um, Is God? We talked about his existence. God is assumed in the Bible, There's not this apologetic laid out five points and six evidences of his existence. In fact, the Bible, basically the, the, the foundational word about atheism is in uh, Proverbs 14, one that says the fool has said the non thinker has said in his heart, there is no God. Notice it's mind heart. He says there is no God. And yet then here we are. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind. Okay. We're not getting lost in the us. That that's a lot there. Some, some, the default is always, well, that's the Trinity. Of course it's the Trinity. There's, there's more nuanced, um, interpretation of that, that we don't have time to get into. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all wild animals and over all the creation that move along the ground. Okay, he's kind of covering, that's pretty much everything. Now, this first point seems self-evident. Again, we are created, okay? We are created. We're not self-made. We were made by someone else. We talk about this often. I don't even need the Bible for this. It's Aristotelian logic, I think, cause and effect, right? For every effect, there has to be a cause. That's just foundational, right? You don't get something from nothing and you don't get living matter from non-living matter if we wanted to go there. But the point being, the fact that we're created means that there's an ultimate, what Thomas Aquinas called the unmoved mover. There's a primary mover and it's God. God created. And you're going, well, Jeff, you're preaching to the choir, brother, because here it is. It's in verse 26. Those of us who follow scripture know that this is the case, but it also means that we've been created with a purpose, There's a being a person behind our creation. This is the teleological argument for the existence of God. All things teleos as a finish, a purpose, an end in mind. And this we see in each one of us. 
So uh, then comes a, an artful and explicit way to say this. Some have noted this is really the first poem in the Bible, verse 27, in chapter one. So God created mankind in his own image. It's like he's saying, now let me parse this out. What was just said, he created us, male and female, in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We're going to talk about that in deeper ways here today, but also particularly when we talk with um, Dr. Katie McCoy about sexuality. So no, we are created. Secondly, look at this. We are creators, okay? Again, some have said co-creators or even co-regents um, because there's this agency to rule and to create. And we've called this the cultural, cultural mandate from God. Look at verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, okay, <laughs> create, I mean, this is like create humans, um, but there's much more than that, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground, okay, so we are created, we are creators, we'll talk further about that, again, just setting it up today, and look at this final point I want you to see, we, we're communal, we're created for each other. As image bearers, we encounter other image bearers, okay, uh, along the way. And so what we see here is we've been created in community. Now we can talk further with Katie about this, but this, this has incredible implications. Um, to be created in his image means that we are relational, right? And this comes from the very heart and essence of who God is. He is a Trinitarian God. And watch this. You don't get this when you're, when you're worshiping a, uh, a Unitarian God. Okay? We believe in a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he is relational in and of himself. right? And so in our relationship with Christ, we are dropped into, no, invited into this, what, what I call a Trinitarian dance, into the Trinitarian relationship. This came to me some years ago when someone explained God would not be eternally, think about this, eternally loving if it weren't for the fact that he is Trinit Trinitarian. He's a Trinitarian God. There's this loving relationship we see. And again, a mystery. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that comes into play. But all that to say, we then are invited into that. And a part of what it means to be created in his image then means that we are relational beings as well. All right? So here's what I want to do. I want us to, uh, I want to introduce Dr. Katie Frugge, who's going to come and join me. Let me, I could offer a long resume and she'll be embarrassed and I won't do that. But she is, you need to know this. She's the director of cultural engagement um, with, with our, our Texas Baptist. Okay. And if those of y'all don't know what that is, the Baptist General Convention of Texas, also Texas Baptist. She's also the director of the Christian Life Commission, which has a lot to do with, with policies and bringing biblical um, guidance, okay, to, to what happens in Austin and she's real involved in that as well. Uh, her, her, her role is she helps us, okay, as Texas Baptists uh, and others, think biblically about cultural, moral, and political uh, issues, all right? No big deal, right? Um, so challenging, and she is the one that I wanted to have today. So let's, uh, let's invite Katie Frugier to come up and join us here. Good morning. Katie, we're so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here with you. Yeah, Thank so you. Have a seat. Um, I didn't say a word about your precious family. I know your husband, Lafayette, yes. is home, uh, maybe watching. I think they're watching right now. Okay, so, so um, you have three girls. Yes. So that's a lot. A little. It's yeah. enough. But tell us, tell us about your girls, because I know Lissy, your middle one, yes, right, had major surgery. Yeah, it's this been a week. big week for our family. So, talk, so yeah, tell us. we're we're a girl fam. We love it. So we've got three girls. 12, 10, and four. And uh, yeah, it's, we're a bit of a unique little family. Um, our, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but uh, two of my children have special needs. So my oldest was born a congenital double amputee. And then my middle child is what we would kind of call medically fragile. So she's mm -hmm. just kind of got a lot of different issues. And she had a major surgery this last Wednesday. Um, and, and she's healthy and she's recovering and doing well. But is it cerebral? Palsy. She has cerebral palsy, and mm -hmm. epilepsy, epilepsy, uh, intellectually disabled, mm -hmm. and a uh, few other little quirky things like insomnia. That's a fun one. Wow. <laughs> so, 
parents, uh, right? I mean, that's a, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have an amazing husband. I do. He's I great. Just, I mean, incredible. He's been really supportive, even at the very beginning of our theological training and education. Interestingly, connecting it to the image of God, I really got interested in this idea of the image of God, um, becoming a mom and becoming a parent, especially to a child with an intellectual disability. Yeah, and wow. so that really is what propelled me onto the theological path I went on. Yep. So, no doubt, comes to play personally mm -hmm. and then how you apply what you have learned and such. Yeah. Um, so, tell me, you heard me kind of unpack it. I know you, others, would frame it differently. Talk to us about how do you frame, talk about what it means to be created in the image of God. Yeah, it all begins, and you laid it out beautifully, Genesis 1 is kind of that foundation point. That's the launching pad that we go off of. Um, within theology, it's really not even up for debate that Genesis 1 clearly says all of humanity is made in the image of God, right? That's so patently clear right there. It gets murky because the next question is, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And then we don't know. There's a lot of different options to that. And we kind of go back to David. What is man that you are mindful of him? Like, how do we understand who we are, God? And Genesis 1, this idea of the image of God, that really is going to shape how we think about what does it mean to be human? Because to be human, according to Genesis 1, means we are image bearers. So how we understand the image of God really shapes so many aspects of what we understand to be human itself. And what is a violation of our humanity? Or what does it mean to be human? How do we affirm the humanity of the other? How do we affirm and recognize my own humanity? How do I live that out? Mm -hmm. And so the image really tells us a lot about who we are and who God created us to be. It also tells us a lot about who God intends for us to be in our future destiny. The image of God to be made in his image points us to this idea that we were made for his kingdom that the image of God tells us that we were made for the kingdom of God, that mm. communal, he's inviting us and calling us and we were always created to have a relationship with him. That was his intent from the very beginning that he's put the seal on us uh -huh. that we don't really even have a say on. He's, he's put that on there. So yes, you described that, you've said it's like a stamp or yes. a seal. It's, a, it's, it's something that's given mm -hmm. right to us. Uh, tell me this then, the question that comes quickly, and we've, we're hanging out in Genesis 1. We know more than Genesis 1. We know what happens in Genesis 3. Yeah. Uh, we see the fall. How has the fall, how do you explain that, how the fall has impacted? Because to the degree that it has impacted us, yeah. um, and, and it might impact the way we, well, yeah, I'm just, I'm a sinner, you know, it's what I do. Right. Um, how, how do you describe that? How do you talk so about that? So interestingly, you know, we, definitely Genesis 3, we all know that we are living in a fallen world and we live with the effects of living in a fallen world. And, you know, we've got car crashes and cancer and all sorts of issues that are the effect of living with sin in the world. However, when you look at the biblical narrative, mercifully, beautifully, that image has not been impacted. That seal that he put on us, sin can't touch that. That is something that he has placed on us. And while we live with the impact of the sin, um, he's working through that still. That image is still fully intact and beautiful because it's something that we didn't earn or ask for. That's not anything that our human action can have an impact on because that's a seal, an imprint that he's put on us from the very beginning. And so when you look at the arc of scripture, every time you see a reference to the image, it's there. It's not like, oh, you know, you had this and then you didn't have it. It's every time you hear even just passing references to the image, think of James 3, um, it's, a, it's a violation to curse your brother or sister because, because. this person is made in the image. Mm -hmm. Okay, so throughout scripture, and we could run all the way to Revelation, we just mm -hmm. might do that, right? Where um, you see hyperlinks then back to Genesis 1. Yes. What, what I, it sounds like you're saying uh, we understand salvation as as a uh, as given right not something we we something we receive yes. not achieve that's likened to that you're saying that no every person and we're all fallen people so if you say well um we all I, i'm just wondering how again the manifestation i guess of the image of god is what's tainted yeah um so we don't see ourselves as we were formed yeah. but he does he sees us still he and, does and so when you think about the image of god i think it's important 
it's, it's how we internalize it. It, it. It's made manifest in different ways. But what we need to understand is every single person, regardless of their abilities, regardless of the choices that they make, are full image bearers. Now, the temptation is going to be to have a definition of the image of God that's scaled, where I can be more the mm-hmm. image or mm-hmm. less the image. And we do that. And when we do that, we kind of justify our actions sometimes. Right. And so, well, you know, I, you know, you know, I can do this because I'm a fallen person or something like that. And we justify acting out on our prejudices. Maybe like, maybe I'm more the image of God so I can justify acting out against a brother or sister in right. a certain way because they're less the image of God yes. in an interesting way. So we start to what we call dehumanize the exactly. other, right? Where do you see that? And I mean, wow, we see it a lot in, in a political season, right? If you have a D or an R by your name, exactly. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and decide that you're wrong or, uh, and I'm exactly. right. Uh, and I guess on a personal level, it will happen this week when we need to catch ourselves in the moment to see, I don't know if it's a homeless person or a person that doesn't look like me, a person who, um, wow, well, they're not as smart as I am. And we can quickly run to, I am, I'm a little better than them and then mm-hmm. treat them in a way, right? Where all, I hear what you're saying is we're all equally created in the image of God, every person on the planet. And we should, we should, um, be present before another person that way. It postures us in a certain way that when we approach another, wherever they are, um, our default should be, this is an image bearer. And how, what is my rightful response to this image that I'm seeing? Because what we're imaging our creator, Mm -hmm. right? So when I approach someone who is an image bearer, I honor them and there's a dignity to them and I give that to them, not because they are a good person, not because they've earned that dignity or respect from me, but I'm doing it as an act of worship of their creator whom I'm seeing in Mm. them as they image that to me. I honor that dignity, respecting and worshiping the glory of the creator they're imaging to me. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying there? It's the, um, you remember this in seminary, I think we all had to read a little bit of Martin Buber, the I thou relationship. Yeah. Um, and he talks about the the I meeting meeting thou, you and me meeting me, but the the ultimate relationship between me and God. Yes. It sounds like you're all it's not a law of reciprocity because God is God does it all. But I am an image bearer, but I'm also reflecting him. Mm-hmm. In my, re- in my relationship with you, with yes. the other, right? Exactly, yes. And I'm showing who God is by the way I yes. encounter you. Absolutely, right. and the posture then becomes an act of worship to God himself because that's what we're ultimately seeing. That's good. So I read this um, this week, uh, Christopher West um, wrote about, he kind of did a commentary or take on John Paul. Uh, the second wrote a book called Man and Woman, He Created Them. It's kind of his um, almost... Summa Theologica, I guess, on, on sexuality. But in, in, in his book, um, West writes this. He says that the body and it alone is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It was created to transfer into the visible reality of the world, the mystery hidden since time immoral in God and thus to be a sign of it. So we, we are not, not like Jesus who perfectly represents, I mean, in the exact location of the person of Jesus, we see the presence of God. Yeah, he is the image of the invisible God. So that's where yeah. all this is heading, right? Mm-hmm. When we go, what does this look like? Right? <laughs> um, we talk about it often here. Jesus is perfect theology embodied. Yes. And if I'm trying to apply scripture and it doesn't look like Jesus in practice, I'm doing it wrong, 100%. right? So, and then that's where, again, that's where all this is heading. And by the way, you heard, we're going to be with Katie on Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, and you can bring your questions because she has all the answers and, um, <laughs> and we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be right here in the great hall, but come join us Wednesday night uh, and each week to follow. It's going to be amazing. So a lot of this will un- unpack some more. So um, let's do this. Uh, we'll start talking about implications, which are vast, right? And immeasurable. Um, and maybe I want to go back to your own personal journey um, because I've heard people uh, talk nowadays about, I heard some, you know, atheist philosopher person say, um, well, we're just brains on a stick, right? Mm-hmm. That we're just rational beings um, 
And so we're just thinking people, and that's how you get into, I think, the, a new Gnosticism. That was the first century, Absolutely. right? Uh, was that Jesus didn't raise physically. Um, talk about all, all of that, there's a lot there. Um, and how that comes into play, because if we're just rational beings, then I can just separate, the way, here's the problem, right? Separate my body mm-hmm. from, from my mind and even what I'm doing. We yeah. see this in, when it comes to a culture of life, when, when we talk about, gosh, the hookup culture is, I can do whatever I want in my body. Mm-hmm. Or even, even it gets into addiction or what I eat or ingest, what I put in my body doesn't matter. I'm ultimately a, a mind. In yeah, a we like to prioritize the brain. That's kind of our bent. We like to prioritize. Particularly the, in the, the West? The, the, like yes, the it's a very Western idea. And it really kind of stems back to, you know, some of our famous theologians, Thomas Aquinas, even Augustine did this to an extent of prioritizing the mind and the brain. And you've probably even heard within church culture, people talk about the image of God being our rational abilities or something like that. But when you look at Genesis 1, He created them male and female in his image, that there's an innate embodiment to being a human and being an image bearer that has to be a part of what it means to be made in God's image. And so when we think about the implications of to be made in God's image, we need to be thinking about bodies as well, that there's an embodiment, there's something real to the Christian faith that is beautiful. Think about Jesus physically raising from the dead and telling his disciples, touch me. You can feel that I'm real. So the body matters. It matters. Eternally, and, even. And, and eternally, 100%. We will be physically risen from the dead and live in a physical heaven. And so when we talk about the implications of being an image bearer, we're looking at the whole spectrum of the human experience. And so we need to be concerned about things that violate the human experience or an offense to the human experience as well. And so that goes from the very beginning of life to the whole spectrum of life itself, right? So just that womb to tomb kind of idea and all those issues, what our concern needs to be is pursuing really, I think what we call a culture of life that really to be made in God's image, um, he has called us to be concerned about the things he's concerned about and ultimately life, life eternal. So there's several threads to run here. One would be there, you know, there's hot topic is um, abortion. Mm -hmm. Um, And you, you like to talk about not just abortion because for some Christians it can be, well, I've voted properly, you know, right. I voted right. And that's, that's my role. And, and our, and it matters, right? Our sure. vote, our vote matters around issues of life, but you would say, and we talk about it here a lot that not, not, let, not just abortion. Let's talk about it. You said a culture of a life, a culture of life. Yeah. Um, There's, tell me more about that. How do you talk about that? There are multiple ways to support a culture of life absolutely begins with the preborn and wanting there's good laws that we can vote on to protect culture of life with that but what about after the life comes how do we support that culture of life how do we support growing that life to have a fullness of life what do we do uh, when there's a challenge to it or there's a threat to that life in different ways and so there's multiple ways to be able to support a culture of life and a lot of different iterations and here's the great part this is where I think the church has got it right for 2,000 years the church when she is at her best it is concerned about raising a culture of life mm. um, here's a fun fact Everywhere the gospel spreads, the two things that follow almost immediately, hospitals and orphanages. Yep. That's a culture of life. That, those are Christians. That's the church doing what the church does best, which is engaging in the culture, concerned about the other, um, because God has put his image on them. And we want to care about our brothers and sisters. We want to care about our neighbor. And that's how we act it out. So in, with your work with Christian Life Commission, um, you're down in Austin. I mean, you guys are lobbying for certain uh, bills or policies mm-hmm. and such. Um, how do you talk about the culture of life? Uh, this idea of, of more than just let's get this voting right. It's more uh, an elimination of of the need for an abortion, right? Yeah. I mean, how do you how do you all talk? About let's it? make it you know unnecessary and unthinkable is kind of a way you can put that. There are multiple studies that show there are a whole host of reasons that contribute to a woman's decision to have an abortion. 
let's look at some of those. Let's make those, bring those barriers uh-huh. down to want to help create a culture where not only does she see a path forward, but she's like, you're walking it with her mm. and doing that and wanting to support um, the vulnerable, wanting to make sure that the true challenges that are out there, poverty is real. Um, there are some real barriers that people are facing right now. Um, you know, my own lived experience of raising children with disabilities there's a lot of barriers that we can help yes. be a part of real t- tearing down that are going to build up this culture of life, um, really building, ultimately, it's building the kingdom of heaven on earth. Right. So, yeah, so many issues. We can talk about that Wednesday night <laughs> a little bit more. But I think of, yeah, to eliminate uh, the, or how about bring options apart from abortion where a woman might think, I don't have the money, I don't have financial resource, I don't have paternal leave, or I, all these mm-hmm. things that come into play that, that stack up for her. Yeah. And she says, I, I can't do this. Yeah. It becomes an option in her mind, right? Yeah. Let's try to it becomes the most it. viable option. And so how do we make that option, how do we, how do we tilt the scale the other way? Mm-hmm. To not only tell her there's a way, show her the way, create the way. Yeah, that's good. I like to challenge my mostly conservative friends um is the question are you are you anti-abortion or are you pro-life those are those could be very different things they can be now anti-abortion can be part of that and then liberal progressive friends are are you are you pro-abortion or are you truly pro-choice like let's all work together to give her a choice that is a real viable choice yeah right so um, let's go back to, I'm curious, and we can, again, we'll dive deeper on Wednesday night. This idea, this brain on a stick, this rational thought um, and how it creates a, Gnostic, a new Gnosticism, um, it, it comes to play in terms of sexuality too. We see, we see this in the Olympics right now. Yeah. Um, is, you know, is she a, a man or is she, you know, all kinds of details around issues that are real and people are, are, are questioning, asking. On a personal level, you have, you have a daughter who's, who's challenged. Um, so you have great empathy and understanding for what it is to have a person not fully functioning mentally. Um, how has that come into play? What are some things you've learned around that? That really is what set me off, like I said at the very beginning, wanting to understand what it means to be made in the image of God. So we have this propensity, especially in the Western church, to equate the image of God with rationality. And we're quickly heading towards a time though where we're gonna have to really step that back and really wrestle and come to a more holistic, comprehensive understanding of the image of God um, as we see people who have intellectual disabilities and we're, but you know, we innately know they're still fully made in God's image. So what does it even mean to be made in God's image? We're quickly heading towards a day where we'll have computers that are probably more rational than we are. They are not made in God's image and we're going to have to think very carefully about what does it mean to be human as we're barreling towards a time where we'll have humans with intellectual disabilities and with intellectual functionalities and people being disassociated from their bodies and all sorts of different iterations uh-huh. for that. So I want to say, we'll dive into that. You've done a lot of work around AI and, and implications even now. So we're going to talk about that Wednesday night mm-hmm. a lot more. You even told me there's, um, I could download all things about me, my brain, right? What is it called? A transhuman, yeah. Transhuman movement, movement of sorts. Yeah, of this desire to eventually get to a point where we can upload our brain into a computer. I could also, exist, I could exist yeah, forever. Yeah, Essentially, it's the quest for the uh, Holy Grail, right? We want to live forever, and so I'm just going to upload my my brain to a computer. But again, that goes back to it violates the very beginning of Genesis 1 where we can see God has created us with these bodies. It's Mm -hmm. embodiment and the seal of dignity and that he's put on us as his image bearers. And it just doesn't go well for us when we start trying to separate those things out. And that can come into play on a very practical level. We talk about it often, but there's theological... um, underpinnings why community is so important why the church is so important Mm -hmm. and why and lots of love all people online or you're in colorado bless you or somewhere on the at the beach or something today um but to be present Mm -hmm. to be fully present that's something you know we've talked a lot about is i've come to to really it's been so freeing for me to just say hey i'm going to be fully present today um, and give, bringing focus and attention to whomever God puts in front of me and whatever he's called me to do, I'm embodied now in this place and to be present in the moment. 
yes. is such an important thing and a freeing thing. And at the end of the day, I, I, was, I, was faith, I was a faithful presence in that moment. And then later this afternoon, I was again and again to seek to be that. It's so important for us to live that way. We need each other, right? We do. And even think about um, the implications or what happens when you have someone isolated from community. It's always a negative impact. It's something innately wrong about that. And you see deterioration every time you see isolation. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, so to, um, to land the conversation, and I'm going to hand this over to, um, to Travis Cook as we, uh, there in the chapel, and here we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, but to kind of land it, I want to offer this. Uh, as I noted earlier, that's not Jesus. That's an image of Jesus, right? Um, but the sun, here's what it says in Hebrews 1, 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And he had provided pu purification for sins. After he had done so, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. I just love that. And though we wrestle and we struggle and the older we get, the more we realize, oh, this body's breaking down, right? Or um, I'll never be what I want to be. Or I don't like my image that he gave me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough, whatever it is. I don't have enough. I, I can't do the pommel horse. You know, I just cannot <laughs> uh, get that done. Um, and, and, and yet, I love what it says in 1 John 3, 2. And we'll close with this. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So that's an amazing thing. To behold him is going to transform us to be like him. But until then, the whole Christian life is to be sanctified, to become holy, which is to be like him. Sanctification is a process of becoming more and more like Jesus, right? And so let me do this. I'm going to close in prayer. And, um, and then we're going to uh, enter into the Lord's Supper together. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for... Uh, this time together, thank you for Katie. I praise you for her life and influence. Uh, we pray you'll continue to bless her family today. And God, we ask that you'll bless this time now as we enter into communion, where you told us to literally to eat and to drink, to become the essence or a part of us who we are, to be our sustenance, your life, the cruciform life, and all that you've done for us as we rem remember now how much you love us. You paid it all for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so now let's do this. Um, as our ushers come forward to, to pass the elements, I want to say thank you to Katie. Let's all uh, thank her for being with us today. Thank you. thank you so much for being with us today. All right, so we're going to worship the Lord as the elements are passed. Let's set our hearts on him, friends. And remember, he's made a way. For us in the in these, you know, sinful bodies yet redeemed, he's made a way for us to bridge the gap through the cross that we can live forgiven. So let's set our hearts on him as we worship him now and set our hearts uh, on the Lord's Supper and remember.